Okay. So, how about we pray? Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right, so we had been... In 2 Kings, actually, scratch that. Is there anything you want to talk about in the sermon? From the sermon. The parable of the wheat and the weeds. You want to be wheaty as opposed to weedy. It was hard to distinguish when you were saying it. <laughs> I, I tried with I my enunciation. Out, yes. Out, Maybe that's why wheat and tares is better than wheat and yeah. weeds. Oh, yeah. Uh, my, my professor in seminary always picked on me because uh, the southern dialect tends to swallow uh, certain consonants. And then I began to notice this, uh, that uh, a lot of times you'll hear people say the Lord. He said, you need to emphasize the D. It's the Lord. Okay. And I forget what else he used to pick on me about. So uh, as long as I was being graded on stuff, I tried to speak with a, you know, pretentious Midwestern accent. And then when I graduated <laughs> seminary, I went right back to, <laughs> by, by which I mean like newscaster Midwestern. I don't mean like, you know, but you know, they all sound the same. So weird, you know, but uh, the Lord. So Jesus Christ. Um, I was in a distinct minority, but uh, yeah, he picked on other people for other things. Well, your so, accent has seeped through to your children. I'm so glad. That warms my heart to hear you say that. <laughs> to, uh, Thomas is about the only one that says my name with that twang of southern accent. I love the way he says my name because it has that, and that's where my name originated from, being that it's so different. Anyway, so I like hearing him say my name because there it does go. have that little, Let's and it must be a direct influence of the father. It must be. It must be. Yeah. <laughs> what can I say? He just, was he just has a little Suetta K kind of, well, not my middle name, but Suetta. Yeah, I can't do it. The only Thomas can do it. There you go. <laughs> so. But I can hear the little girl saying it like that, that my mom Suetta. named me after wherever she sure. was or is. And um, so I can hear that, and I like that. So it's, yeah. <laughs> That's good. Dulcet tones, no doubt. Okay, so anything, wheat or weeds, anything that you thought about or wanted to share? Okay, good deal. Be sure while I'm gone, I'll be here this Sunday, but uh, take copious notes so you can report back to me. We'll have two different guest preachers, and uh, I'm always very interested to know how sermons go when I'm not here. So, okay, so we had been in Second Kings. Uh, today we are doing Jonah. Will you be here Monday for the funeral? Yes, I will be. Yep, I was not going to miss the funeral. So, all right, Jonah. So the reason we're doing Jonah right now is basically because uh, we are following the basic chronology of the history of the Old Testament. Jonah is, uh, is well, let me hold off on that for a minute. My mind is in a couple of different places right now, as I'm sure you could understand. Uh, Okay, when Jonah takes place, so this is 8th century B.C. Now, we finished not long ago with King Ahab, who was a great guy, that we really mourned his passing. And uh, from about the, the end of Ahab's reign up until uh, the reign of the, the king in Jonah's day, I think that's about 85 years. So, the king in Israel at the time is Jeroboam II. Jeroboam I was uh, the first king of the northern kingdom when Israel and Judah divided. Jeroboam I is this kind of 
prototypical bad guy because as we go through the kings and you hear about uh, the kings that do not follow the Lord and they don't walk in his commandments, usually it says they followed in the way of Jeroboam. Jeroboam was the one when the kingdoms divided, he didn't want the Israelites going down to the temple, so he made the two golden calves, okay? So this Jeroboam, not the same one, actually this Jeroboam is the great grandson of Jehu. Jehu was the one who assassinated Ahab and Ahaziah in accordance with uh, the word of Elijah, who appeared in the sermon, by the way, on Sunday. Um, so that's this Jeroboam. Uh, I mention that because something maybe you've noticed about the book of Jonah, and I haven't quite figured this out. Uh, when it comes to people who do not believe uh, that the scriptures are the word of God, there is something about the book of Jonah that earns a special ridicule. Now, there's a lot of miraculous things. Uh, the fish has got something to do with it. But there's a lot of miraculous things in the Bible. And for some reason, I've never quite figured out why they always pick on Jonah. Because of Jonah and the fish and a couple of other things. So the, and of course, there, there are also Christians who are Christians of goodwill. They're well-intentioned. And they too find it rather hard to swallow, uh, that, uh, that was bad, that, um, you know, that Jonah was swallowed by a fish, all right, and they're like, well, maybe it's a fable, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's folklore, maybe it's just a parable, so it is interesting, though, that in the Old Testament, the prophet Jonah is mentioned outside of the story of Jonah, now, it's only one reference, and it's actually from 2 Kings, but I gave that to you on your sheet, uh, when the author of Kings is talking about the reign of Jeroboam II, what we learn about Jeroboam is that he restored the border of Israel from Lebo Hamath as far as the Sea of the Araba, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, who was from Gath Hefer. And that's the only reference to Jonah outside of the book of Jonah. But the thing that we see is that Jonah is a historical person because the books of Kings, nobody disputes, those are historical books. So, of course, this is not really what we know Jonah for, uh, but he's a real person. He's alive during the reign of Jeroboam II, and you see that he's from Gath Hefer, which is in Zebulun. Zebulun is in the Northern Kingdom and it's part of the region that later is called Galilee. Jesus of Nazareth, right? Because Nazareth is in Galilee. So that's the first thing that, um, just something to keep in mind, uh, that is not usually going to convince anybody that Jonah was really swallowed by the fish. But nevertheless, it's not a fable, uh, because Jonah was a real and an historical person. Okay, anything about that? All right, so as to the book, oh, I'm going to share something with you. This is a, this is a parlor trick that uh, pastors like to pull sometimes when they are guest pastors somewhere else. All right, so if uh, they're coming and they're going to fill in to preach and they have a Sunday morning Bible class, what a lot of pastors do is they're like, I need to do something short. The book of Jonah is pretty short, and I am I'm hoping that we'll actually do it all today, which is not impossible. But uh, so usually what a, pa a guest pastor does, we're either going to do Jonah or we're going to do something like Jude. They, they never choose Philemon because, you know, Philemon, Paul is like, says uh, to Onesimus, you need to go back and obey your master and not be a runaway slave. So usually that is not something, you know, that you just do on the fly. So it's usually Jonah, and the problem with that is uh, just because Jonah is a short book does not mean that Jonah is not a profound book. And of course, what we're doing here in our study is we're looking at the highlights. We're looking at the main things in the overarching story of the Old Testament. There have been many times that we have skipped, summarized, and gone on other rabbit trails, and uh, I've never claimed that we did otherwise. Okay, so we, we can't study it in depth, 
But there are a few things that I want to point out to you as we go through Jonah today. Because what often happens when, uh, when the attitude is, let's do something short and get it over with, usually we get something wrong. One of the main things that we get wrong about Jonah, and I heard this because I, when I was at church once, had a guest pastor come to the Bible class. He's like, well, since I'm only here for one week, we're going to do Jonah. And uh, he said the bottom line of Jonah is that, you know, you're supposed to evangelize other people. It's not the point of the book of Jonah. Uh, the book of Jonah is not about us. It's actually about God, like the rest of the Bible. Part of the point is that God is gracious even to people outside of the Lutheran Church, or outside of um, the people of Israel. You know, that, uh, that that's the reason that Jonah is sent, uh, because the people of Nineveh need to repent. It's not about evangelizing people, but we'll look, we can look at that some more. So, we're not under any illusions today. We're going to do the best we can do and uh, put it in God's hands, I guess. So... All right, anyway, uh, we don't know who wrote Jonah. There's a lot of intimate details about Jonah in here, like uh, what we'll see in chapter 2, his prayer from the belly of the fish. There's really only one person who could have known about his prayer in the belly of the fish, right? Unless God struck somebody else with this inspiration, right, and told him what Jonah prayed in the belly of the fish. So uh, maybe Jonah doesn't really matter. Uh, some of these other things are fascinating to me, maybe not to you. Um, we know the time by which Jonah was written. At the, well, the latest, it was the early 2nd century BC. We're talking about the 8th century. Uh, so that's quite a bit of time. There's really nothing to suggest that Jonah was written later than the events. But if you want to ballpark it, they know from other things uh, that Jonah was written by the 2nd century. All right, one other thing about the book, it's, well, two things. So Jonah is one of the prophets. I mean, the book is one of the prophets. It is not technically, in terms of its genre, it is not history. But this, this class is about Bible history. The reason we're looking at Jonah is because Jonah is a very unique book among the prophets. Most of the prophets, so we're talking about there's, there's the big four. It's four, right? Isaiah, Jeremiah, you can include Lamentations, five, Ezekiel, Daniel. Those are the major prophets. Why are they major? Everybody else is lieutenant colonel. It's just because they're longer. They're, they're very long books. Yeah. Everybody else is just chopped liver. You know, you got Jonah, Mike, and Nahum all the way to uh, Malachi. That's the only thing. The, the major prophets are longer. The minor prophets, there are 12. And Jonah is a minor prophet because, as we all know, it's a short book, <laughs> which means it's simple. Um, so Jonah is one of, the, he's one of the 12. But the thing that's unique about Jonah as a prophetic book is that Jonah is really not what we call oracles. This is one reason sometimes you might struggle when you read the prophets, whether they're major or minor. Because, yes, there's like a historical fulfillment to the things that the Old Testament prophets say. But most of the prophecy that you're reading is not telling you exactly what the prophet's talking about. There's a lot of symbolism. There's a lot of imagery. You recognize some of the Jesus parts, like the virgin shall conceive. Oh, I know what that's about. But most of the books of the prophets, you, you really need some study notes or some cross-references to be like, I didn't live 4,000 years ago, so I got no idea. <laughs> Egypt, Babylon, Edom, I don't know what that is. Okay, so most of the prophets are oracular, okay, they're oracles. Jonah is not. Jonah is narrative. It's a story because it's historical. And so that makes Jonah different. So Jonah then comes at this roughly in this period of the kings that we've been talking about. And that's one reason that we're going to look at Jonah. We're not really going to look at the other prophetic books, but we will look at Jonah. Yeah, Chris. Is it not oracular? So yes. That? So it's not, it's not an oracle. So let me give you, maybe let me give you an example. Um, let me find one. It's like, well, we mean like, uh, it, it's a word from God, it's prophecy. 
So I just, I have Jonah open, but I'm looking at the end of Obadiah. Uh, so this is an oracle. Uh, the end of Obadiah says, Those of the Negeb shall possess Mount Esau, and those of the Shephelah shall possess the land of the Philistines. They shall possess the land of Ephraim and the land of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. So he's speaking of something prophetically, uh, but it's, it's a different kind of reading than what we've been doing, where we have a story. Elijah sent to Ahab. He tells him there's going to be a drought and a famine. Uh, now there's prophecy in there. Elijah prophesies. But it's not this long, extended um, prophecy that we have in the other prophetic books. Does that help? Yeah, okay. It's something that's going to happen. But yeah. It's something that's going to happen, but it's very symbolic and mysterious and it really it requires like an unveiling so really go home and pick any any of the books of the prophets and kind of try to read it daniel's a good example so daniel is a mix of both narrative and oracle we're very familiar with the narrative parts of daniel you've got um shadrach meshach and abednego it's in the book of daniel you've got uh daniel in the lion's den you've got some things about nebuchadnezzar but then you have Daniel talking about uh, all of these visions that he sees. Uh, there are these statues. Uh, the statues made like it's got feet of clay, you know, head of gold. You're like, okay, well, not me. Uh, then there's like, there's horns, and he sees all of these other things. Ezekiel sees a lot of monsters. And usually there's nothing in the text that says, all right, so the feet of clay are this. You know, the horns are this, like the monster is this. Those are all oracles. And those are, for anybody, more difficult to follow and put together than just a straightforward story where I got a plot, I got characters, and it's pretty clear what it means. So, but that's Jonah. That's why we like Jonah. Other than it's short, uh, it's a narrative, not really an oracle. So, okay. Are you used the same way, like in where I've heard it most. Mostly is in current movies like that have a lot of violence and all those and old oracles, and, um, Lord of the Rings type of things. You know, yeah, like I mean, oracles. kind of. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the because that's the prophet. He's only to speak the oracles of God. Um, and yeah, yeah. I mean. Yes, that's a good tie-in. Thank you. You know, I like I like my movie tie-ins. So, uh, yes. You know what Thomas has been watching recently? Finally got him into the Three Stooges. Okay. Oh, wow. Usually what happens, this is not my fault, I don't think, but uh, if Caitlin's got to go somewhere or she wants some time to herself or whatever, I'm like, okay, we well, leave the children with me. And uh, before she's even out the door, Thomas and McCurry are like, we're going to watch TV, Daddy? I'm like, you bet we will. So my, my need a Hershey's Kiss or something like that. But uh, there's some, he doesn't quite get the slapstick. It doesn't disturb him, but he doesn't quite, like, now, if you fall down a manhole, he thinks that's kind of funny. But uh, we're still trying to get that. But he, he enjoys it. Um, Funny thing is, he likes the Three Stooges. Macrina likes Superman better than Thomas does. <laughs> you know, but it's fine. Batman's the best of them all. But anyway, so, okay. I'm doing this to myself, I think. <laughs> okay, so, Joan is a story, like stories. Also a true story. Uh, the one other thing that we would be remiss if we don't talk about, because part of the goal of going through the Old Testament is, on, at one level, is to familiarize and refresh ourselves with the stories of the Old Testament. But the other thing is we always have to see the Old Testament as Christian scripture, because that's what it is. It is not just things happened before Jesus, blah, 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 a lot of names, very complicated. And then we get to the part that we're a little more familiar with. Uh, Jesus is eternal God, and Jesus is in the Old Testament. He's proclaimed in the Old Testament. And it's only through Jesus that all of these things hold together. Jesus really likes the story of Jonah. Last week we talked about types. There is something called biblical typology. There are events and persons in the Old Testament that are pointing toward Jesus and what he will do. 
They're not exactly prophecies, because sometimes it's just an action. You know, it's kind of like crossing over the Jordan River that we talked about last time. Elijah crosses the Jordan before he's taken into heaven. The Jordan is very significant for the salvation of God's people. This one, uh, I, I think, is pretty straightforward. Uh, and I gave you the quote, bottom of page two, from Matthew. And always important, too, one of the cardinal rules of understanding the Bible is that Scripture interprets Scripture. The, the best commentary, excuse me, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. I say that as somebody who owns many dusty and big commentaries. Uh, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. The best way to understand the Bible is to read the Bible and to read it over and over again. So, very important to see how does Jesus, the Son of God, who inspired the thing, read the Bible, okay? That should take care of people's reservations about giant fishes, in my opinion. Uh, Jesus is once again fighting with the Pharisees. Well, they picked the fight with him. Then some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And then he tells us what the sign of the prophet Jonah is. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish. So there's the type. Jonah is pointing forward to something else. And notice uh, he is treating Jonah as a real person who was really in the belly of the fish. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He will be, he was dead three days in the biblical sense of three days. So I know people always want to ask about that, but the son of man, Jesus, will be three days, three nights in the tomb in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they, the Ninevites, repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here, i.e., Jesus himself. So Jesus uses what happened to Jonah, Jonah being in the belly of the fish, to say, I am greater than Jonah. But in the same way, so that's, that's the comparison. In the same way that he was in the belly of the fish three days, the Son of Man will be in the tomb, he'll be dead three days. Uh, and uh, he's, he is implying that uh, it'll be much worse off for the people who get to see the Son of God in the flesh and reject him. Because the Ninevites didn't get to see Jesus. Uh, they had the most reluctant preacher in the world. One of the funniest things about the book of Jonah is that this sermon that Jonah is supposed to preach that converts the whole city is like five words. You know, <laughs> That's the summary that we get. They repented. They believed. These are awful pagan people. And so Jesus is saying that generation of the Ninevites will rise up and condemn your generation because you have rejected the greater Jonah who's coming to your midst. Okay. So that's how Jesus reads the story. I think the way that Jesus reads the story is a pretty good guideline for how we should read the story of Jonah. All right. Any questions or comments about that? All right, enough of that introductory stuff then. Can we do it? I think we can. One hour. All right. Would somebody then in the book of Jonah, chapter 1, in my Bible, that first, uh, first two paragraphs are 1 through 6. Would somebody, actually, let's just do 1 through 3. 1 through 3 of Jonah 1, please. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. 
So he paid the fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. All right, thank you. Uh, one of the things that I do love about the book of Jonah is that it is a wonderfully ironic story. And as we go along, I'll try to point this out to you. Uh, the first and biggest one is that Jonah is the preacher. He is supposed to, when, he is, when the oracle is delivered to him, the word of God, he delivers it to the people. Uh, you would think the guy would know. He can't run away from God. <laughs> what are you talking about? But he, he determines to go what in their minds, the farthest away place that you could. Uh, the, the land of Tarshish, which might have been an island or it might have been, you know, inland of somewhere else. Today, they don't really know. They don't know where Tarshish is. Tarshish is mentioned many times throughout the Old Testament, and we do know that Tarshish was known for its mines, its precious metals and gold and silver and things like that. And their mine, so it's somewhere across the Mediterranean. It would be west of the land of Israel. That's like Timbuktu to them. That's where Jonah decides to go to flee from the presence of the Lord. So he goes down uh, to the port city of Joppa, which is Jaffa today, and uh, gets on the boat thinking that he's going to run away from God. So you've got two ironies there. One is the disobedient prophet. The other is that he seems to think that he can get away from God. And now why, why would Jonah not want to go? Uh, Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Now up to this point, we haven't talked about the Assyrians much, but the Assyrians are kind of the next great enemies of the people of Israel. It will be the Assyrians um, a little while later, not in the lifetime of Jonah, about like 60 years or so, 722. The Assyrians will be the people who invade the northern kingdom of Israel, they will take the ten tribes into captivity, and they will never return. That's, that's true up until the time of Jesus, even. Uh, some of the main bad guys, right? Assyrians and Babylonians. So the Assyrians are, are the enemies of the people of Israel. Now, you can, I think, sympathize maybe with Jonah. I don't want to pick on Jonah too much. I mean, think about what we know about Israel. So Jonah, he is from the northern kingdom. Pretty much all of the kings of Israel were bad. They were evil. They were unfaithful. We've already seen plenty of that. They're constantly forsaking God. God is constantly calling them to repentance, and he is constantly warning them, I will destroy you. Right? He's already told them about the temple in Judah. Right? He says... My name will be here forever as long as you're faithful to me. When that time ends, I'm getting rid of this thing, which is exactly what God does when he sends Nebuchadnezzar to destroy the temple. Now think about, you're Jonah. You're faithful up to this point. And God says, I want you to go and preach repentance to the people of Nineveh. What might happen to your homeland if the people of Nineveh repent. If God spares Nineveh and you're still wicked, they're going to wipe you out. Right? Because God promises he will. Like he will eventually mete out his judgment. So in, in a kind of unfortunate way, I think one of the ways that Jonah calculates this is my people have forsaken God. Now God wants me to go preach to these Gentile people. If God has mercy on them, he forgives them, he will prosper them, and it might be the end of Israel. You can kind of understand Jonah's reluctance to go and do that, right? So, because Jonah's very clear, but he does not want God to forgive the people of Nineveh. That's kind of how the book ends. You know, he thinks God's kind of a dirty rat. He said, I didn't want to go because I knew that you were a God who was gracious and merciful. And I did not want them to be forgiven. I did not want them to repent. So that, I think, I don't think that's an unreasonable motivation. I think that's a safe assumption that, that that's at least part of what Jonah is saying. Uh, the other thing is, 
to what I said earlier about how the book of Jonah is not about how you need to evangelize other people. Uh, that's its own other discussion. But think about the, the prophets were always sent to either Israel or Judah. And that makes sense because those are the people of God. They know that, theoretically, they know the God of Israel. The people of Nineveh don't know the God of Israel. And as far as I can think of, Jonah is the only prophet in the Old Testament sent to the Gentiles. Jesus doesn't go to the Gentiles. It just so happens. He works it out. There are many Gentiles who believe in him in the days of his earthly ministry. But the apostles don't go to the Gentiles until St. Paul, when God directs him explicitly to do that. So that's one reason Jonah is not about make you feel bad about not sharing Jesus with people, because uh, that wasn't God's expectation for the prophets. Okay, you should, okay, you should share Jesus with people. What I'm saying is, uh, that's not what the prophets did. That was not Jonah's sin, that he was like, oh, I, I thought it was just for the people of Israel. Jonah's sin was he was told to go, and he would not go, because he did not want God to be gracious to them. Okay. I always thought it was because he was afraid. I don't know. I they could do ugly things, things, things to him, too. Oh, yeah. Well, and, I'm, and that could very well be. Uh, big, and again, Nineveh is the capital of this empire. It was probably the largest city in the world at the time. And they were wicked. Okay, uh, The way that God says, well, what did he say exactly? For their evil has come up before me. That is a very similar phrase applied to Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 18. And the men of Sodom and Gomorrah were wicked, great sinners before the Lord. Right? You know what God did to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what Jonah would like to have happened to Nineveh. Uh, but uh, they are infamously wicked. And uh, so it could be, yeah, not the kind of place you, you want to go. You know, especially not to share uncomfortable truths, you know. It's great, yeah, it's great. Even people who don't, they got nothing, they don't know anything about the Bible, they know about Jonah and the whale, you know. So, yeah, it's good. So let, let, let's have the fun continue, shall we? Okay, the uh, next paragraph, would somebody read that for us, four to six? But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain, lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. Okay. So, the Lord sends this tempest upon the boat. Here's another irony. There's kind of two in here, I guess. The, the mariners, the sailors, cry out to their God. They're pagans, by the way. So, whatever God they're worshiping, they cry out to their God. And Jonah is doing what? <laughs> Deep asleep. Jonah's like me, so I sleep through thunderstorms. I know not everybody has that gift, but uh, sometimes I sleep through alarms, too. But um, Jonah is asleep. All right, number one, there's a storm going on. Number two, it doesn't seem to really be affecting Jonah's conscience very much, you know, that he's fleeing from the presence of the Lord. Uh, this also happens when Jesus calms uh, the storm on the Sea of Galilee. That, uh, And he's not in this this big boat with oars and sails and everything. It's a little fishing boat, you know. And Jesus, it says, is decked out, you know, on a cushion. And the disciples come and say something very similar to Jesus. Said, Lord, do you not care that we're about to drown? You know, and Jesus is like, be still, you know. Um, very similar. Uh, this is ironic, you know, that uh, number one, it's kind of funny he was asleep. But uh, they, they immediately... 
They have a conscience. They call out to their God. They wake up Jonah because they want Jonah to pray to his God, too. Okay. So, uh, anything about that? Any comment? Jonah does come across a kind of a dope sometimes. Verse 7, they are pagans, so we're going to try to get to the bottom of this in the pagan way. They said to one another, come, let us cast lots so that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. He drew the short straw. Then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Kind of ironic that now he's confessing his faith. Not to the people he was sent to, but you know. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. And notice, too, what we're going to see. Uh, these pagan sailors are more merciful than Jonah is. The guy who does not want to preach God's mercy. 13. Nevertheless... So their ship is about to break up. He told them what they need to do. And they're like, we're going we're gonna to tough it out. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, not to their own God. O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Ironic, okay. The, the pagan sailors worship God. They try to spare Jonah's life. They can't do that, so they, they pray that the Lord not hold it against them. And then after they get rid of Jonah, probably afraid that the poor guys drown, then they make sacrifices to the Lord. That's right, he did, which I think has a very good point about how you can't be too programmatic about those things. Uh, the, the best way to share Jesus with other people is the people in your life, whatever your arena is, work, family, your neighbor, whatever, this is the best and most organic way to share the truth about Christ. And lo and behold, before we even get to Nineveh, these pagans now believe in the God of Israel. All at Jonah's expense, basically. <laughs> so, yes, that is a very good point. So, all right. They throw him into the water. And then Jonah, as he is, and mind you, he's probably in very great danger of drowning. He suddenly hears that theme with the low keys of the piano, <laughs> right? Dun, 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 dun. We took the kids to Lake Huron on uh, Saturday, put on their little life jackets, and they got in the shallows, and they thought they were swimming. And Kate was like, you want to get in? I said, no. I am a mountaineer. I am, I am not, I'm not a swimmer. I, I like seeing the water. I think we're blessed with a lot of lakes here. Uh, mm -mm, and I saw Jaws. Okay. I saw it. But sometimes... I think the bull shark has been known to get into the Great Lakes. So, just so you know. Yes, I mean, I again, another fish story. I don't know if it's true. But uh, the stir, yeah. So, anyway, I enjoyed myself. I think I saw that the other day. Yeah. So, there you go. It's a great historical Wednesday because I think that the shark week on TV. Yes, it is. I've seen those ads. I saw those ads. I'm like, ooh. Uh, never quite, I probably, no, I don't want to derail. I never got over, you know, North Carolina's got the Outer Banks. Uh, the Outer Banks, with those barrier islands, that water in between them, where people love to go swim, 
gets nice and warm and all of these sharks this time of year always come and every year I look at the news and it's like somebody else got their arm bit off you know by a great white shark I'm like why do you keep doing it to yourself that's what I don't understand uh, anyway okay so he hears the theme music verse 17 and the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights all right I swallowed up Jonah. That's all we got to say. Um, yes, a lot of the, the storybooks say the whale. I do want to tell you, in fairness to the storybooks, uh, the, the people in the Bible times, they were not scientists, okay? They, they had not come up with species and things like that, all right? And it's, it's, not, it's not fair to ask the Bible to speak in a modern scientific way, okay? Uh, God created the stuff that swims in the water on the fifth day. That's a fish, okay? Swims in the water, it's a fish, okay? So it doesn't matter, yes, sorry, we know biologically whales are mammals. Whether it was a fish fish, you know, that breathes with gills, or it was a whale that breathed with lung, it, it doesn't matter. That's not germane to the point, right? You just have, you take the Bible on its own terms. What uh, happened and uh, really after the scientific revolution really began in the 17th and 18th centuries is the default of most scientists in the Western world was that the Bible is literally true. So, good for them. Our scientists today could learn from them. But they would do things like they would read the story of Jonah. They know the story of Jonah is literal history. And uh, they'd be like, all right, let's try to figure out what species of whale could have swallowed Jonah. Um, it is apparently true. I'm not a biologist, but uh, most whales would not be able to swallow much more than the things they actually eat, which is very good for you and me. So they eat krill, they eat plankton, like on SpongeBob, you know, they, they eat like little things like this. There are some whales that could do it, like the sperm whale. Most famous sperm whale in the world was Moby Dick, yes, and uh, it's because because sperm whales they they go to great depths and they will eat giant squid, which is real. Uh, they've taken tentacles out of the stomachs of sperm whales that are gigantic, you know. I always think it's so interesting the comment that we know more about outer space than we do our own ocean depths. That's why the ocean scares me. Okay, you got no idea. And all my sympathy to those people who died, you know, on the Ocean Gate thing, but whatever is down there, you know, down to the Marianas Trench, no thank you. Uh, that's right. That's another one of these other great Oscar winning movies coming out, the, that sequel to the movie about the other giant shark, the, the, the Mega, have you seen the Megalodon thing? Because apparently the prehistoric shark, you know, like his mouth is as big as like, you know, this room. So, it should not go down there. Uh, so anyway, so the sperm whale could theoretically. Uh, then the next thing that they want to bug you about is, yeah, but there's no oxygen in the stomach. Methane, basically. And it's like, well, look, man. It's a miracle. That's right. A, God, a man and a whale will do whatever God wants them to do. Uh, so, and then he would be in there and like, you know, he wouldn't be digested because he was alive, but uh, he'd be covered in gastric juices, you know, at a temperature of like, eh, probably, you know, 100, 120 degrees. So, anyway, yes, it's, it's what happened. So the fish swallowed up Jonah. What you, what you really need to get to with people like that, because they want to talk about this, they want to talk about that, they want to talk about evolution, eating apples, Adam and Eve, and whatever. And uh, what I try to get to with people is, do you realize that you are a sinner? Do you know that you're going to die? Do you know what God actually feels about you? That's why, that's why Jesus matters. And the thing is, if Jesus is raised from the dead, and he is, then when he tells me that Jonah spent three days, three nights in the belly of the fish, I'm like, sounds good, better him than me, you know. 
So. I know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's one of the things a sperm whale has going for it, though, apparently. It's, uh, it's got a... Um, it's got a four-chambered stomach, very similar to a cow, because there are, as you know, both mammals. Yeah, exactly. It's like, you don't like that one, you go over there, just don't go too far down. Um, but, okay, anybody else? Any other edifying comments about that? Okay, chapter two. We probably won't analyze, you can just let the art flow over you. But Jonah does pray to God from the belly of the fish. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. Some of the imagery in Jonah's prayer is really, really great. The first thing is that he says he has gone down. Well, he's, he's crying out out of the belly of Sheol. Sheol is that Hebrew word for grave, right? The realm of the dead. That's where Jonah is calling out from. Uh, he cast me into the deep. And then as he keeps going, well, one thing, all the waves and the billows passed over me. That sounds absolutely terrifying. I don't know if you've ever had an experience almost drowning, but Jonah thrown out in a storm with all, all the water in the world, basically, you know, weighing down on you. What he says in verse 4, I am driven away from your sight. Now, Jonah is not so naive, or whatever word. Uh, he doesn't mean at the bottom of the ocean, God is not near me. Now he's talking about something more severe. Uh, to not be on the side of God, to have God turn his face away from you means that God has condemned you. So as he is sinking, he has this horrific sinking realization that he has been rejected by God. All right, that the God has withdrawn his presence from him. He has turned his face away. And then he says, yet I shall look, I shall again look upon your holy temple. Now, whether that means that Jonah, even in his distress, believes that he's going to live and he's going to be able to go back to Jerusalem and worship again, it does not say. Um, the, the people of Israel, and I think the Jews today still do, um, they try to pray in the direction of Jerusalem because God had told them, from this house, I will hear your prayers. So th this could be. This is Joan, a part of Jonah's repentance. I shall again look upon the temple. He knows to call out to the Lord. That's how he started. He said, out of my distress, when I was cast into the grave, I was cast into the sea. I look upon your temple. I call out to the Lord. Verse 5, the waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. This one I really love. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. It's like, you know, he's, he's entangled in the seaweed and everything. He's going down to where the mountains came up, you know, when all those plates shifted at the flood. He's going down to the root of the mountains. You, you know how massive mountains are. He's going down to where they came from. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever, yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. See, that's what he means. Looking upon the temple, he is, he is looking to God for his mercy. It is an interesting question that I had never considered before, and the text does not tell us explicitly. But uh, I read a few people who t have toyed with the idea that maybe Jonah did actually die. And there is, there's another kind of Christ picture here. There's kind of resurrection, you know, that it's a mercy that the whale swallows him and that he lives in the belly of the fish. Um, what Jonah is saying here is poetic. Okay. He's not literally claiming that the seaweed wrapped around his head. I don't think he had the time for that. He's thrown out in the middle of the Mediterranean, you know. 
But uh, he does say his life is fainting away from him. You know, he is drowning. I don't think he kept his mouth closed, you know, in the middle of a, you know, hurricane at the bottom of the ocean. Um, I think that's a really interesting reading. I don't know if it's true. He would have died. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, He would have died. And that's the other thing. The, the first thing that we see, yeah, it sounds terrifying. Swallowed by a fish. Monstro, you know, in Pinocchio. Swallowed by a fish. But uh, this is God's mercy to him. Yeah, God still wants him to preach to Nineveh. But the other thing is, this, is, this will keep him from dying. At least dying permanently, right? Uh, it was a good thing that however, however the Lord did it, it says he appointed the fish, you know. God definitely can communicate with. Any of y'all watch Star Trek? Yeah. Remember, uh, there were only really two good movies. The first one was The Wrath of Khan. The other one was The Voyage Home, which is known as The Whale One. Do you remember The Whale One? Okay. Maybe if John was here, I don't know. The, 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 the blah, blah, blah. Giant fish whale one. Whale. That's, there's my southern accent. The whale one. Uh, that was the one. Very important. This is what you need. This will enrich your reading of the book of Jonah. That was the one. I think it was the voyage home. That's the one when they go back in time. It's the original Star Trek cast. You know, Kirk and Spock and the rest of them. They go back in time because uh, in their day, the uh, some alien something probe uh has come to earth and it's wreaking havoc and like there are all these like these terrible storms you know the earth is going to be destroyed because it has some kind of message that they can't interpret it's a language they don't know well somehow the the um the crew of the enterprise finds out that uh it is uh it can be under it's basically the blue whale or the humpback whatever it's a whale language it's extinct at this point. So they have to go back to 1986 San Francisco to take a whale, transport it on the Enterprise back to, you know, 2200 or whenever they live so that the whale can communicate with the thing and they can save the earth. Excellent movie. Uh, really good. But um, yeah, so God, it's no big deal for God to communicate with the fish. That one is really good. It was a good one. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they, they sing to one another. It's kind of cool. Yeah. So, so don't, you know, the, was, the point of it was kind of save the whales, you know, because if you kill the whales, it can, could be in the future that some, our planet might be destroyed, you know, if you don't save the humpback whale. So, yeah, exactly. That's, that's good reason to colonize other places, I guess. All right. So anyway. Verse 8, toward the end of his prayer, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. All right. Chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Let us try this again, shall we? Now that you're combing the vomit out of your hair. Uh, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. This time he says, Yes, sir, right away, sir. He goes into Nineveh. Now, because Jonah, I, again, I don't, I understand the fish thing. I understand the hang-up people have with that. For whatever reason, Jonah is the redheaded stepchild of the Bible, and everybody's got to pick on Jonah. Um, 
One of the other things that, that critical scholars don't like is the size of the city of Nineveh. This would be a massive city, okay? Because you see the breadth, not the length, mind you, just the breadth of the city. It's a three-day walk through it. What they say is that ancient archaeology does not confirm that Nineveh was that massive. Okay, Nineveh was a big city. It was the largest city in the world. They, they did not have like megalopolises like we do today. Um, so this, this has bothered people. It does not take three days to walk the breadth, which by the way is modern day. Uh, the ancient city of Nineveh is in the city of Mosul in northern Iraq. A uh, very interesting part of the world. One of the things that uh, ISIS destroyed several years ago was uh, what, I, I don't know if it's only the Muslims, but the Muslims consider the tomb of the prophet Jonah. So, um, good thing. There was a lot of road construction. Well, <laughs> there, there could, <laughs> let me tell you, this is a time of year I'm like, <laughs> all right. Anyway, could have been a lot of road construction. That's true. I think that's a good reading of, uh, <laughs> yes. So now, no more. Apparently, if, if they're right, you know, then that means that Jonah did not return from Nineveh. Really too bad they, you know, these idiots <laughs> destroyed the tomb. I'm glad they're not people in our country who are defacing and erasing our history and our heroes. I'm so glad that doesn't happen in this country. Um, so, anyway... There have been other explanations given. Uh, the thing that I always want to remind you of is we can, we can find good explanations. That's really not a problem. Um, but because we've been called by the Holy Spirit to faith in the gospel, I don't have to know which one is right. It, it personally does not bother me. But there are some really good explanations. Now, a part of it is, and this kind of goes with like the science thing, uh, you know, the Bible's not a scientific book. The biblical writers would not have distinguished between a whale and a fish. There, there's a lot of times uh, the, the biblical writers are very non-technical. And that's fine. That's not really a problem. Uh, sometimes, and I think I gave you a note about this, uh, sometimes Nineveh can refer to the city proper, to the Assyrian capital. Uh, sometimes it can refer to the greater region. This is what the scholars say. Uh, and there is, what do they call it? The greater Assyrian triangle, I think. Let me see. Where is it? Put it under somewhere. Yeah, five. Thank you, Chris. Yes. Uh, so the, 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 the greater none of the region or the Assyrian triangle. That would be a complex of cities. So I could, I could a lot more readily believe that it was three days' breadth. Three major cities. And Nineveh is the biggest. It's the capital of the empire. So it's Nineveh. And he is walking. That is true. <laughs> yeah. And then there was construction. Miles in circumference. Okay, in circumference. Not something I'd want to walk, personally. Um... Yeah, so, and that's, there's, the, the, the thing that, the default assumption that you always need to have is uh, we always assume the non-idiocy of the writer, <laughs> okay? A lot of these things that the people consider challenges to the reliability of the Bible are not really that. Might it just be that um, when I encounter something in the scripture, Again, that somebody else tells me an error. I, I don't know anything about ancient Nineveh. <laughs> I'm not going to northern Iraq to look at it, okay? Um, but the, the things to think through. When you find something in the Bible that is difficult uh, or something that you do not understand, what, what a Christian does is a Christian says, so the, the error is either either my translation, or uh, I have misunderstood it, so the error is in me. That's just how a Christian reads the Bible, you know. That, does, that doesn't make ambiguities and things hard to understand disappear. 
Uh, but that, this is the, the correct attitude as a Christian with which to read the Bible. You always assume the problem is with you, right? Um, and that's true whether you're talking, about, you're talking about doctrinal things, historical things, whatever. Um, there's so many things that people will very confidently say. And then all it takes, I guess, to, to overturn what they say is you just wait another generation for them to un unearth some pot that proves, oh, the Bible was not as wrong as you seem to think it was, you know? So you just play that, play that game and just, you know, let God sort that out. So, but I don't think it's a stretch to say that this could be this complex of cities. Uh, one of the reasons is the Bible does stuff like this all the time. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah is a good example. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah uh, were not the only two cities that were destroyed um, when God rescued Lot out of the city. Number one, you know, we say Lot lived in Sodom and Gomorrah. He, he did not live in two cities, okay? It's not like, you know, it's a bedroom community to my job or whatever. Um, he lived in Sodom, but it, that's what we call metonymy. It's when you substitute one thing for a bigger group. So like when somebody says, the White House said, the White House did not say, you know, that lady, whatever her name is, Jen, whatever, uh, she's the one who said, representing what the Biden administration said. Uh, the House did not speak, okay. You know, my favorite one, since we're on, we're on the, this kick today, somebody says, well, pastor, you're from the Carolinas, and I'm like, no, are you from the peninsula? Uh, you can't be from two different places. <laughs> like, they're not the same thing, okay? There is North Carolina, South Carolina. You cannot be from the Carolinas, just, you know, just so you know. Um, but Sodom and Gomorrah is like, it's metonymy for something else. Uh, there were five cities that were destroyed by the angel of the Lord. Um, they were Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Zoar. And the biblical narrative is clear about that. But they call the whole region Sodom and Gomorrah. I think it's the same thing with Nineveh. I don't think that's the, that's not that hard, you know. So anyway, any comments about that? I guess people from North or South Dakota feel the same way. Like you're from the Dakotas. <laughs> Not saying there's that great of a difference between the Dakotas, but um, I wouldn't know. I've never been there. So, anyway. So, again, kind of funny. Uh, this main thing that Jonah has gone to do, the author summarizes for us in four. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And Jonah only went one day's journey into the city. He <laughs> It didn't even cover the whole city. So I would assume that means that uh, the sermon that Jonah preaches, it spreads like wildfire. They carry the message throughout, you know, the city and the greater Nineveh region. And then good news, but also a very deep irony. The people of Nineveh believed God. And the most unlikely of people to do that and they repent. They have these outward manifestations of repentance that we see throughout the Old Testament. Uh, they put on sackcloth. We'll see that the king puts on ashes. And uh, it says they fast, right? They fast. In the meanwhile, what has Jonah done other than, I mean, to his credit, he goes, he preaches the word. Uh, I didn't hear a whole lot, and I'm not saying he didn't repent, because uh, he learned better. It doesn't say Jonah repented. It doesn't say that he put on sackcloth and ashes, nothing like that. But these pagan people, again, are outdoing Jonah in their repentance and their outward manifestation of that. And it's, it's like that easy, you know, like the word of God is powerful. The city repents, the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Verse 10, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Right? God is good to his word. Um, something I, I think would be interesting for you to see, I forgot to put it on here. Uh, 
What we do know about the ancient city of Nineveh is that even though it was the capital, uh, it was characterized by a lot of unrest and sometimes verging into anarchy. Now, even though it's the capital, Nineveh at this time is like a city-state. So it is part of the greater empire, but it has some degree of autonomy. So there were power struggles and things like that. I read that they found an oracle. That's what they called it. A Ninevite oracle. That uh, one of their gods threatens um, that the king will die, the sun will be darkened, there will be plague and famine and all of this stuff. This Ninevite oracle dates generally to the time of Jonah. So it could have been they're looking around in this, uh, they have a lot of political and social upheaval and all of the crime and all the kind of sodomitic stuff, you know, is going on in Nineveh. And uh, with all of this uncertainty, with all of this bad stuff going on, it might just have been that they were a little more receptive when the oracle comes from the Hebrew God and says, guess what? The whole 40 days, whole thing will be wiped out unless you repent. So, kind of interesting. Um, the other thing, so it says the king of Nineveh. This is the last thing that these geniuses like to pick on when it comes to uh, the book of Jonah. And I'm telling you these things because I want you to know what is the nature of the objections, you know, to the reliability and the historicity of the Bible. Um, this is like the whale thing and like city versus region thing. They don't like that it says the king of Nineveh. Because Nineveh didn't have a king per se. The Assyrian Empire had, I suppose, the emperor. The Assyrians did not use the word king. I don't really, I don't know how this is that big of a deal. Uh, if somebody is talking to you, you know, we'd have to ask John and Trish. Uh, you know, uh, the United Kingdom has a prime minister. What does a prime minister do? I got no idea what a prime minister does. If somebody asked me, I'd say he's like the president. He's the British president. Now, you can be a pinhead and be like, oh, no, 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 no. This president is this and a prime minister is that. But it's like, oh, yeah, same thing. <laughs> okay, he's, he's the president. Um, does more than, the, um, than King Charles, probably, other than go to banquets and stuff. But uh, it's the same kind of thing. You know, uh, they use non-technical terms, just like Pharaoh. He's not really the king of Egypt. He's the Pharaoh. But it's like, what is a Pharaoh? He's the king, you know, this is how regular people talk. OK, that's really not that big of a challenge, you know, to the authority of the Bible. Now, since we know that Nineveh is like in a semi independent city state that very possible that the king here is like he is the big kahuna okay of the city of Nineveh he's the administrator fine they called him the king you know um, our country is rife with kings I find uh, I find the American attitude exceedingly arrogant um, these bureaucrats and politicians wield much more power than King Charles uh, they rule over us, okay? We are filled with rulers and kings, and they line their pockets. I don't really think that much about this. Whole, we don't got no king in America, you know? It's like, no, you're right. We don't have one. We've got, like, how many are there? 50 in the House of Representatives? Um, yeah, come on. Like, the king, the head guy, okay, in Nineveh, repented. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, there's a, there's a language barrier, you know. Hebrews have a king, but they don't. But it's like, so what do you call it? The king. <laughs> the prime minister, the president, you know. Things like that happen. And the king even repents. Puts on sackcloth, it says. And he covers himself in ashes. All right, anything else about that? Some people claim that the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, uh, you know, is congregational and that, uh, you know, 
we don't have church bureaucrats or politicians. And I'm like, interesting thought. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> yes. Shannon will get to see all of them. You know, the whole curia will be assembled. All right. Chapter four. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. So here it is. Jonah gives his reason. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Well, gee, that sounds like an occasion for praising God, don't you think? You know, that's the Psalms, is that 136? Give thanks to the Lord, he's good. His steadfast love endures forever. Uh, therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Now, we heard a similar prayer. Remember, Elijah, he wanted to die because uh, Ahab and Jezebel were hot on his heels. He was the last prophet. You know, he didn't think there were any more faithful Israelites. So out of his despair, he prays, Lord, I'm no better than my father's. Please take my life. Jonah here, definitely sulking, self-pity. Uh, why do you want to die, Jonah? Is the whale not scary enough? He's like, I want to die because you are gracious to people that I don't want you to be gracious to. And God, who um, maybe you could say has been a little heavy-handed with Jonah, storms and whales and stuff, uh, God doesn't blast Jonah. He says, do you, do you do well to be angry? You think you should be angry. You, you have the right to be angry that I had mercy on non-Israelites. That just so happens the ones that you hate the most. Uh, he just asked him a question. In fact, I think that's all that God does up to this point. There's a few statements in here, but generally just questions. He's just asking. Jonah went out, verse 5, Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. It almost seems like he has some kind of expectation that God is going to renege on what he said and destroy Nineveh. So I pitches his little tent. He's sitting right there. He's like, all right, time for the mushroom cloud. He's in denial. You know, he is pouting. God's not going to be impressed by that, you know. Six, now the Lord appointed. There's that word again, appoint. In the same way that he appointed the fish. He appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So, you know, he's getting sunburned and he's out in a, you know, tropical climate, basically, and uh, has been kind of rude to God, but God still miraculously causes this plant, you know, to grow over him to save the back of his neck. So don't have to go to the dermatologist. <coughs> so Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. <coughs> but when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm. So the worm also, like the plant and the fish, operating under his orders. He appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And Jonah, who is channeling his inner five-year-old, he said, yes, or maybe 13-year-old girl, I don't know. I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. I wish I were dead. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons 
who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle. At least find it in your heart to spare the cows. <laughs> what happens to Jonah? Nobody knows. Apparently he was buried in Mosul, you know, where Nineveh was. Maybe he had heat stroke and died, you know. Uh, it would be interesting, though, you know, you can't really say, does Jonah repent? I hope he does. Um, somehow somebody else knew the story. But uh, he loves the plant more than he loves these people. And we just end with what God says. That's how we began. We began, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, and the word of the Lord comes to Jonah again. He obeyed the first time, eventually. He obeyed the first time. We don't know what Jonah does. With This is a rebuke from God. So he says, so you, you felt sorry for the plant. Okay. Uh, should I not feel sorry? Should I not have compassion? On, other than the cattle, uh, there are more, he says, than 120,000 people in the city who do not know their right hand from their left. You know. We really should want what God wants. God wants the salvation of all of the world. He wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. It's above our pay grade to kind of explain, okay, so salvation is all God's work. I do not have the free will as a sinner to embrace him, accept him, or choose him. So it's all up to God. All people aren't saved. I don't know what to do with that. But at, at the heart of it, though, we want the thing that God wants. We, you want all people to be saved. Uh, we, should want, we should want it to be that hell would be empty. Uh, but we don't know if he stayed there and preached. We have no idea. <laughs> he now has no plant, you know, to keep him from frying to death. And God, God sends the wind, and then the sun beats down. <laughs> uh, the 120,000, uh, definitely, if we're talking about, you know, Nineveh as a region, there's a lot more people than that. So there have been a couple of explanations. What is 120,000? Some people say, and I would say be cautious about this one, uh, 120,000, he's speaking that there are at least that many children. And the argument is because they don't know their right hand from their left. So God would be saying, okay, so you, you don't think I should pity, other than the innocent cows, you don't think I should pity over 120,000 children who don't know the difference between good and evil? What's wrong with you? Now, you got to be careful with that one because... The Bible very clearly teaches original sin. So the, the claim of the Bible is not, therefore they're not accountable. You know, if, if you're conceived and born in sin, you're a sinner. Uh, that's why we need to be baptized. But uh, they don't, they do not rationally know, you know, that they're not to the decision-making point in their life where they can choose between the good and the evil, okay? So it could be that. Um, it could just be, and I mean, what, what trips people up is it says 120,000. There are probably more people, exceedingly more, if you're talking about this triangle of city. Uh, but it's also true that, um, that adults are ignorant. I, and not ignorant in the sense of, oh, I didn't know, but uh, like, the, if you do not know God, that is a profound ignorance, right? Um, and, uh, I mean, Jesus says on the cross, uh, when he's crucified, Father, forgive them for they, they know not what they do. Now, okay, the Pharisees know what they're doing is wrong. They know what Jesus has claimed. They know they've put him to death on a baloney charge. But could they fully, yes, they're morally accountable. Do they fully grasp what they're doing? According to Jesus, they no, they don't. You know, they don't know God. They don't really know the truth. If they really knew the truth, they would act on it. So it could be that why the number, I don't know. But he's saying all of these people, well over 120,000, they don't know 
their right hand from their left. A lot of times so. they call it the animal, too, didn't they? It, I mean, it depends, yeah. And it's here, it's just the word person. So it's like, I don't know, man, woman, boy, girl. Um, but yeah, like the feeding of the 5,000, that only counts the men. It doesn't count the women and the children. So, but his point is, would it not, would it not be a pity for all of those people to be destroyed? Because that's not really what God wants. That's kind of his consequent will, you know. He had said, if you go and preach, I will relent. You know, I'll relent of the disaster. It's what he wants to do. Um, so it's a kind of haunting ending. Just leave Jonah there. He can fume and stew in his own juices and figure it out, I guess. That's all, all we know about Jonah. So, uh, so the, some of those storybooks, like the one I remember having when I was little, you know. And then Jonah said he was sorry. I'm like, well, I don't know if he said he was sorry or not. You know, that, that, would, be, that would be the crowning irony of the book. If after all of this, the word of the Lord, the storm, the fish, Nineveh, repenting, salvation. And then the, the chief one would be that Jonah still does not see things as they are. So, yeah, it makes me think maybe he did write the book and then he's writing everything down and then, you know, dies of dehydration or heat stroke. That seems like a probable reading to me. I, don't know. I hope he does. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to be like Jonah and say, like, yeah, you get what you deserve. Uh, but anyway, do you have any closing thoughts or questions? Your last quote about <clears throat> not in the sheets. So yes. Jesus said, mm -hmm. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Um, why, what, why is that there? Because uh, to, to me that sounds very similar to what God says about the Ninevites, that he says there are these over 120,000 people who do not know. They're, the knowing is the thing in common. They don't know their right hand from their left. Um, which is, I, I guess, is not so much to say, oh, I didn't know I was doing anything wrong. It's, no, they're, they're so lost that they don't know up and down. That's, that's it. He's like, they are so profoundly lost. You know, it is pathetic. That's why I want to have mercy on them. Not because they're innocent, but because they, they don't know the right hand from their left. Yeah. Good question. Anybody else? Okay. So, no Bible class the next two weeks. Um, I'll be in the Carolinas. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. But anyway, so, and then... Um, yeah, Pastor Morrison's funeral is Monday here at 11 o'clock. Uh, because they lived in St. Helen, they're having uh, visitation on Sunday from 2 to 6 uh, at, uh, somebody say it for me, Stuart Hall? Is that right? Stuart Hall and McLaren in St. Helen. So. Uh, Who's going to be here for you? Will be here. I will be here for the funeral. I, and then. Uh, we have on the sixth guy who was recommended to me, Richard Hugerhide. the best name in Synod. And then uh, Bob Roberts from Bay City will be here that following Sunday. So, yes. So, yes. Robert Roberts. So, I heard him preach this uh, ordination I went to. I thought he was a trip. So, I hope you enjoy him. Make sure you tell me what he said. Uh, and if we had a Bible class, I would always say, ask difficult questions and uh, make sure he doesn't do Jonah, you know. But uh, that won't have to happen. So let us close with the word of prayer. Gracious Lord, our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are indeed a God slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, uh, that you relent of disaster out of your grace and mercy. We thank you. Uh, for the sign of the prophet Jonah. Uh, we thank you that our Lord Jesus um, endured death in the grave and uh, for three days and three nights that he spent in the heart of the earth, uh, that he might bury our sins and give to us 
that same forgiveness and salvation uh, that you gave to the people of Nineveh. We pray that you would soften our hearts and minds, uh, that we might uh, extend uh, in the circumstances of our lives this grace and mercy to all people, uh, knowing uh, that you pity them, that you desire them as your children. We pray that you would keep us always as your own dear children. Give to us every comfort and peace uh, in the gospel. Comfort BJ and Sean and their family with the hope of the resurrection. We pray that uh, in the strength of this grace and these gifts, uh, that we would do those things that please you, that you would guide our steps, and that all things be to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you.